نصلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Respected brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh I sincerely welcome you to our class in our journey of exploring Usul Al-Kafi, which is by far the greatest work of Hadith that we have in the school of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. Last year, we examined the very first chapter in the book of Al-Kafi, which is Kitab Al-Aqli wal Jahl, the book of intellect and foolishness. And this year, we continue to the second chapter in Usul Al-Kafi, which is the book of knowledge, Salaam. Kitab Al-Ilm. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. We spent nearly a year last year examining just one of the chapters of Al-Kafi, about 30 narrations, 30 hadiths. There was so much to them. We had so many wonderful discussions that revolved around these shining words of Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them. And we really did not go too deep. So just imagine the richness that exists in the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt, salamu alaikum. Just imagine the richness that exists in these wonderful gems that have been passed down to us from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. So we spent a year examining how many hadiths? 30. And if you remember from last year, how many hadiths does the book of Kafi contain? 16,000 16, narrations. What is 30 compared to 16,000? That's less than 1%. We examined less than 1% of this book and it was so rich. Just imagine the size and magnitude of the teachings that the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, have given us. So last year we examined the intellect, how to develop the intellect. We stated that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gifts us the intellect. And we made a distinction between the intellect and intelligence. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a chance to develop the intellect. It's not something we're stuck with. God gives you an amount of intellect, but you have a role in expanding that intellect. intellect or for some people in shrinking that intellect because it does shrink. Injustice, oppression, sins, they do take away from the human's intellect. We actually have a narration which whenever I come across it, it really sends a chill down my spine. The hadith states the one who commits a sin, a part of his intellect shall be taken away for him eternally. Just imagine. And the one who's repeatedly sinning, what kind of injustice he or she is doing to themselves? So we examined the intellect, we examined the soldiers of the intellect. The Imam Ali Salam beautifully in one hadith talked about the soldiers of the intellect. Imagine as if intellect has this army. What composes the army of the intellect? These soldiers. And we talked about them in detail. This year, we shall examine the book of knowledge. Why does Al-Kulayni rahmatullahi alayhi, the author of this book, Thiqatul Islam Al-Kulayni, this great scholar who spent 20 years of his life gathering and compiling this book. Why did he choose knowledge to be the second book after the intellect? We know why he started with the intellect. The intellect is the most beloved creation of God. It's that tool which allows you to see right from wrong. So it's the most important and he starts the book of Kafi with the intellect. The second chapter is knowledge because the most important soldier that develops the intellect is knowledge. Intellect is like a processor as we gave the example last year. For a computer, to work, you need a processor. The faster the processor, the better. But if you have a processor without data, what's the point? 
If you have a strong processor, state-of-the-art processor, latest technology, but there's no data that you're feeding it, is it going to yield you any output, any results? No. Knowledge is that data. Knowledge is that data that you feed into the intellect. And the more you dive deep into the depths of knowledge, the stronger the intellect becomes. The more fruitful it becomes, the more beneficial it becomes. So that's why he starts with knowledge, because out of all those companions that we talked about, the companions or the soldiers of the intellect, the 75, knowledge is the most important. So the author starts the chapter with a hadith, this is on page 13 in your book. On page 13, we have the first hadith in the book of Al-Ilm, in the book of knowledge. أخبرنا محمد بن يعقوب. Who's Muhammad ibn Ya'qub? That's the name for who? Kulayni himself, right? The author. The author, Al Kulayni, his first name is Muhammad and his father's name is Ya'qub. His name is Muhammad ibn Ya'qub. Now he's saying, Akhbarana Muhammad ibn Ya'qub. Muhammad ibn Ya'qub informed us. Now he's the one who's writing this, but in the science of hadith, it was common that when you start a new chapter, just to remind the reader who is narrating to you this book, he would put his name. In other words, he's saying, I inform you that I got this hadith from my teacher. He just lists his name. This was just a common uh, tradition at the time. Some have also stated it could be one of his students he wrote this, just to remind us that this book is from Kulaini. But the first possibility is probably greater, and, and scholars have taken the first possibility, that he himself, Kulaini, has written this statement, not one of his students. I know it, it might seem awkward that the author himself is saying, you know, so and so, and he mentions his name, has informed us, Salamu alaikum. But this was actually common. And could it be the authenticating a chain, so giving a name and therefore... Well see, we, we know that the book is authored by him. So any chain he gives us, we know it's through Kulaini. Why in this particular hadith he mentions his name? Because in other hadiths he doesn't. If you look at, for example, hadith number two, we don't see him doing that. He usually does that in the beginning of an important chapter, just to remind us that these narrations are being transmitted through me. So أخبرنا محمد ibn Ya'qub, who is Al-Kulayni, عن علي ibn Ibrahim. Ali ibn Ibrahim is, the, is one of the teachers of Al-Kulayni. He would take hadiths from him, and he is reliable, thiqa. عن علي ibn Ibrahim ibn Hashim. Ali ibn Ibrahim ibn Hashim, his father's name was Hashim. عن أبيه, who's his father? Ali ibn Ibrahim ibn Hashim. Who's his father? Ibrahim ibn Hashim, right? Because if we say Ali, the son of Ibrahim, the son of Hashim, from his father, who's his father? Ibrahim, the son of Hashim. Ibrahim, the son of Hashim, we talked about him last year. Scholars have divided into two camps. Some of them believe he's thiqa, authentic, reliable. Whereas some believe he is Hassan. For those who took the science of hadith, Hassan means what? What type of report is that? We have the Sahih, which is the authentic one. We have the Hassan. Do you remember what was the difference between the Sahih and the Hassan? Sahih gives you certainty that it's true. Well, no, the Sahih, yeah, the Sahih means this person is authenticated. We know for a fact that he's trustworthy because. For example, scholars like Najashi have explicitly stated that he is trustworthy, he's reliable. When it comes to the Hassan report, the good report, there are narrations that praise this narrator. For example, he was a pious man, he was very religious, he had good akhlaq, it's praising him. But we don't necessarily have a hadith or a report that says he was trustworthy or reliable. In any case, we accept the Hassan report. So some scholars believe he was absolutely truthful. 
Some scholars believe he was good, so we can take his hadith in both cases. In both cases, he is reliable. An al Hassan ibn Abi al Hussein. Al Hassan ibn Abi al Hussein is anonymous. In the science of hadith, we call him majhul. We don't know whether he was reliable or not. When we go and examine history, what has reached us in history cannot confirm his reliability. Because remember, many, many reports and books got lost in history. So unfortunately, we do not know whether he was reliable or not. Al Hassan ibn Abi al Hussein al Farisi. An Abdul Rahman ibn Zayd. Abdul Rahman ibn Zayd is also anonymous. We don't know whether he's reliable or not. When I say anonymous, it doesn't mean we don't know who he is. We know his lineage. We know who his father is. We just don't know if he is reliable or not. He is the son of Zayd. Who is Zayd? Zayd is the son of Imam Zayn al Abidin, the one who became a Shaheed. Zayd ibn Ali ibn al Hussein. So this narrator here is the son of who? Of Zayd. Now Zayd, his father was reliable. But his son, we don't have any reports in history that confirm whether he was truthful or not. So we cannot verify whether he was truthful or not. An al Hassan. An Abdul Rahman ibn Zayd. Now, some have stated this could be a mistake in some of the versions of Kafi. Some have said Abdullah ibn al Hussein ibn Zayd is the one who narrates this, not Abdul Rahman ibn Zayd. So, scholars of hadith actually disagree whether it was him or another narrator. In both cases, they're anonymous. We cannot confirm their reliability. An Abi, his father Zayd, of course, is very reliable. An Abi Abdullah alayhi salam. Who is Abu Abdullah in the science of hadith? Al Imam Ja'far al Sadiq alayhi salam. So this hadith is from Al Imam al Sadiq. Now, just to remind you from last year, we discussed this. If we have someone in the chain, in the Senate, who is anonymous, majhul, or who is even da'if, weak, does that mean automatically the hadith is weak? No, it does not mean that. Because we said the chain is only one clue that determines whether a hadith is sahih or not. We have many, many other clues. So al kulaini when he puts a hadith like this, first of all, this hadith is confirmed by the Qur'an. Number two, it's confirmed by other hadiths. Number three, he had actual proof during his time that this is a sahih hadith. But because now, after 14 centuries, we lost many of these reports, sometimes we don't know whom these individual narrators are. So we cannot say, okay, as some people are doing these days, they look at this chain, let's scrap this hadith. That's unacceptable. You can't just look at a chain and if there's an anonymous narrator say this hadith is da'if. That's not acceptable. This hadith is confirmed by, by many, many pieces of evidence that it is an authentic hadith. So this hadith is authentic in its content. The chain itself, yes, we cannot verify. But remember, the chain is only one clue. It's not, you know, what determines whether a hadith is sahih or not. What did the Imam السلام, state in this hadith? Qala, Imam al Sadiq السلام, Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. The Imam السلام, attributes this hadith to his grandfather, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. Talabu al ilmi faridatun ala kulli muslim. He says, seeking knowledge is an obligation. Faridah means something that is imposed on you, something that is mandated, something that is obligated. It's an obligation upon every Muslim. This is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made wajib. It's not something that is just encouraged, no. Seeking knowledge is necessary and mandatory. A few questions here. What knowledge are we talking about? Is it, is it wajib for me to go and become a chemist, a physicist? We've got hundreds of sciences out there and hundreds of, of, of you know, types of knowledge. What type of knowledge is the Prophet here discussing? Exactly. The Prophet is referring to what? The religious sciences. That 
knowledge which you need to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to know about the existence of God, briefly the attributes of God, God is powerful, God is just, God is knowledgeable. You don't have to go too deep to fulfill the obligation. Yes, it's recommended to know more about the religious sciences, but that bare minimum is just to know Allah, to know the prophets whom He sent, and the teachings of that prophet, you know, the branches of faith. So we have Usul al-Deen, which is the belief in God, prophethood, imama, the day of judgment. That's the bare minimum. And then the branches of faith, how you practice your faith, how to offer a proper salah, how to go to hajj, how to fast, what are the basic requirements and conditions. This is wajib. This is not something that is, you know, just encouraged or mustahab. It is mandatory. If someone does not seek this knowledge, has violated that obligation imposed on him from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now when it comes to the natural sciences, or the other types of sciences we have in society, is it wajib to learn those? Scholars have mentioned there is two types of obligations. We have wajib aini and wajib kifai. What's the difference between the two? Wajib aini and wajib kifai. Kifai, if somebody, um, one person does it, it... Exactly. Wajib aini is an individual obligation everyone must fulfill, like praying. Can someone pray Salat al-Dhuhr on your behalf? If that was possible, I bet you most rich people would have done that. They would have given money to the poor and have them pray on their behalf. Allah says, no, you have to pray. You yourself have to pray. You can't delegate this to someone else. It's wajib aini. Many things in Islam are wajib aini, individual obligations. On the other hand, we have wajib kifai, which means it's a collective obligation. If one fulfills it or a group fulfill it, then you don't have to necessarily fulfill it. For example, praying on the dead body of a deceased person. Praying on the dead body, Salat al-Janazah is wajib, but what type of wajib is it? It's kifai, meaning if a group of Muslims prayed on that body, you no longer have to go and pray on him. It's mustahab, but it's not wajib. Burying a, a, a dead person, that's also wajib kifai. Now amongst the examples scholars give for that collective obligation, is those sciences that society is in need of. For example, we need a doctor in our community, right? Let's say we live in a village, there is no doctor. It becomes wajib for at least a group of people to become doctors. If we don't have engineers, architects who can manage our traffic, our construction, our daily affairs, this becomes wajib. So when the Prophet ﷺ talks about talabul ilm, seeking knowledge, yes, foremost comes the religious sciences, but also scholars have taken this to be more general. Not only the religious sciences, but any science, any door of knowledge that society is in need of, it's an obligation. If no one fulfills it, everyone is deemed sinful in the eyes of God. If a group of people fulfill it, then yes. That's fine. I don't have to go become a doctor if there are sufficient doctors in my community. So the Prophet ﷺ states, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيضَةٌ عَلَىٰ كُلِّ مُسْلِمْ Now, another question over here, when it comes to the branches of faith, like praying, fasting, and these details, I as a lay person who is not a mujtahid, who's not a jurist, the Prophet says you have to seek knowledge. Now when it comes to the details of Salah, I don't have knowledge about these details from their original sources. I mean which one of us went and researched everything about Salah and Hajj from the Quran and the Ahadith? Instead what do we normally do for the layperson? What do they do? They rely on a mujtahid. They are muqallij, they emulate. Now the argument is well, the Hadith of the Prophet says you have to seek knowledge, that means you have to go do your own research. Why are you relying on other mujtahids and scholars and, and accepting their fatwa? Is this a valid argument? No. Why? Because not all of us can have time to do what the mujtahids are doing. 
let's say we do. Let's say you can make time in your life to become a mujtahid. But we are also given an option of... Exactly. When, when we say seeking knowledge, it means either you yourself seek it or you will rely on an expert. Same thing with other professions in society. Lawyers, doctors, engineers. Either you become a doctor and you could treat yourself when you become sick or rational people say you've got another alternative. Go to a qualified doctor. If you go to a qualified doctor to get treated, do, will people blame you? And tell you why didn't you yourself become a doctor? No. Rational people do not blame you for that, right? Yes, they blame you if you yourself don't become a doctor and you don't go to a doctor. Then you sit home and you make up your own medicine or you just don't treat yourself. Then if something happens to you, you'll be blamed. Other, otherwise, you won't be blamed if you go to an expert. Same thing over here. When it comes to the details of our religion, yes, we're relying on experts, but that in itself is seeking knowledge. When you open the Risala Amaliyah, the code of laws for your merja, for example, and you read their fatwa, that is knowledge. That's a type of seeking knowledge. You're aware of the ruling and you got this ruling from an expert, hence it's valid. Then the Prophet states, Ala inna Allah yuhibbu bughat al ilm. He says Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves seekers of knowledge. And the love of God means that we achieve a high status with Him and that He rewards us. Because Allah doesn't have emotions. So when, whenever we come across such a statement that God loves so and so people with these qualities, it means either their status will be elevated, Allah will reward them, or as we mentioned last year in our Islamic beliefs course, we have a beautiful hadith that says the Ahlul Bayt act on behalf of God because they are God's representatives. So whenever a hadith says God loves a person who has these qualities, it is the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, who love a person who has those qualities because they're acting on behalf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you become closer to the Ahlul Bayt, peace be upon them, and they will love you more upon seeking knowledge. This is the first hadith that we have in this chapter. Any questions on this hadith? So just a quick question, Sayyidina. So a lot of different professions, professionals, they do have to seek knowledge in their fields to essentially expand and do better good within the realms of their fields. So from that standpoint, after a certain period of time in your life, you realize that, okay, you have spent so much time on that end. Would that still be counted? I guess in terms of some form of knowledge uh, as far as in relation to this hadith goes. You mean those people who focus on their profession for their entire life well, and they expand so much? See for example what I'm comparing is uh, for, uh, for a scholar who goes to Hausa for 12 years. As far as Islamic scholars go, they're essentially seeking knowledge for their entire life because there is no right. limit. It's, it's a lifetime journey. It's a lifetime commitment. So now, people in different lines of professionals, whether, whether they're doctors, lawyers, or engineers, they are also required to keep up with their line of Correct. knowledge till the end. But then, when they look at it around them, if they would have spent the same amount of time, perhaps in the path of Islamic scholarship, would that have been more rewarding? So now, when you start questioning that, weighing these two in, I mean, how would you, uh, what would you have to say to that in terms of, is everyone else pretty much has wasted a lot of time in the different lines of uh, professional fields? That's a very good question. As we continue into this chapter, I'm sure many of you will have this valid concern. You know, I'm missing out on all these amazing virtues and all this reward for becoming a scholar in the religious sciences. And some people might read these hadiths at a later stage in their lives and they might feel regretful. I wish I would have taken a different path. So how do you address this concern? If there is so much reward and so much emphasis on the religious sciences, should you have become a scholar and spent your entire life in the seminary or seminary work? Or no, you just continue your profession. At the same time, just know the basics of the religious sciences. 
That is a very difficult choice to make. It's not that cut clear what the answer would be. But basically, here's my understanding. If there is a sufficient number of scholars in society who are guiding people, who are delivering the religious sciences, who are doing constant research to get closer and closer to the core of Islam, then if someone spends a lifetime in another profession and they're mindful of their faith, they also support religious institutions and projects, it's, it's difficult to say that becoming you know, a scholar of religious sciences then would be better. Because we do have many, many hadiths and stories of people who were not scholars. Just you know, average people, when you look at it from the outside, they're average people. Some of them could be store owners. Some of them could have you know, different professions. They had a very special status with the Imams of Ahlul Bayt. Sometimes the most trusted of their companions would not be companions who were officially scholars. They were just an average store owner, for example. Being in your profession, but being mindful of God, worshiping God properly, fulfilling your dues, obligations, that has a great value in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sometimes that could outweigh being uh, you know, a scholar by profession. But if there is a need, if you live in a community, in which there is a need for scholars to educate the youth, to protect the future of our communities, then what we understand from the ahadith is that becoming a scholar is probably has greater value, value in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it really depends on the era, the circumstances, the community you live in. But this need is very important. We have to see where is there a need. In fact, you can apply this principle to all professions. If you go to a community and you see most people are doctors, right? And you see there is actually a need for other professions. It is more rewarding to take those other professions. Because in the end, serving people is what counts in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you always have to see what is the need. Today, I see many youth in society, that's the last thing they think about. When you are trying to decide your career for yourself, yes, you should do something that you feel passionate about, obviously, because if you dislike something, it's very difficult to succeed at it. But when you're trying to figure out what profession you want for yourself, the first question you should ask, is there a need? Is there a greater need? Can I do something that can better serve my community or no? That's a very important question to ask. Many of us don't ask this question. We just take on a career without considering all these factors. So if there isn't that great need, then probably you know, focusing on your profession and expanding in it a lifetime, we could say that it has a lot of value in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's still difficult to make that judgment, Allah knows, but we're safer trying to make that judgment. I mean, in, in that, uh, what you just mentioned a little earlier, okay, you, you are excelling in your profession, but at the same time you are accommodating perhaps another Islamic scholar who is in that path to make, the, uh, make uh, resources and things more available to them. Would you still get that? That's, that's, that's a very good point. Let's say you're in your profession, in your career, at the same time you're sponsoring an Islamic project, or like you said, a scholar in their work, in their research. Now all the reward that that scholar gets, you're getting a part of it because you're sponsoring that project. That has a great value in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you could make a case that they're, they're kind of equal from one perspective. It's true that the scholar is making that effort, but really those efforts would not have been possible, let's say, without the sponsorships of generous people who are supporting the Hausa institutions, supporting Islamic institutions, making these programs available. That's very important. Allah considers the sponsor to be equal to the one who's making the effort. Absolutely. So you have a role in that. Now when you factor in all these factors, you could make the case that they could be equal from, from many, many different perspectives. Yes, absolutely.
And we have, we have actually a hadith about this, about people who support projects, people who sponsor projects, or people who you know, sponsor others to do something good. Whenever you sponsor anyone who's doing good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala considers you a partner in that act. Absolutely. So this is a great opportunity. And that's why those who did not take the path of scholarship, they shouldn't lose hope and say, I missed out. You didn't miss out. If you see a project that is supporting the teachings of Ahlul Bayt, go support it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will consider you a partner. That way, maybe you didn't study 20 years in the seminary, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you that reward of studying 20 years in the seminary because now you're supporting the one who did. And that's from the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Forgive me for elaborating a little more on that, but uh, so as a result of some folks feeling like they have missed out, you would find them sitting in a gathering, for example, and then I'm not sure if it's because of shame or ignorance or whatnot, they're like, ah, path of Islamic scholarship. From that standpoint, that individual who is not aware or perhaps just maybe ignorant to a certain degree, for them to even remain silent or even promote what the Islamic scholars are doing out there in the field, that in itself is also showing support, I would say, in that path, rather than just saying, ah, oh, I'm not sure if that really is a profession or not from that standpoint. I mean, I find a lot that you are in gatherings where people might say, uh, what exactly does an Islamic scholar do? They're not aware of the lifetime commitment that they have to go through through their entire lives. But just informing the crowd in those gatherings as well that the kind of hardships that Islamic scholars go through is something... That is a level of support. That in itself is a level of support, absolutely. Just bringing that awareness to people is a, it's a type of support. Because sometimes that awareness can, you know, trigger, ign something. Tr trigger something in that gathering and, you know, you might find that they'll sponsor something, they'll do something out there. And the one who triggered that is a partner in, the, in that tawab. It's beautiful. The system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beautiful. And really on the day of judgment, the most shocking thing that will be on the day of judgment is not the punishment or the sins. Allah is Arham al -Rahmin. The most shocking aspect of the day of judgment is the rewards that Allah will give you and you are not even accounting for them. You are not even expecting them. Sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you an infinite amount of reward, mountains of reward. And then when you ask God, what did I do to earn that? You'll, you'll realize you said one word. One word that generated a huge impact in society, like that ripple effect. Sometimes across the globe, one word, one small act, absolutely. That's from the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's now go to page 17 and examine hadith number 3. Because the second hadith pretty much is, you know, contains the same wording of the first hadith. Ali ibn Ibrahim, who is the teacher of Kulayni, he's reliable. And Muhammad ibn Isa, a reliable narrator. And Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman, a reliable narrator of the Imams. And Ba'di Ashabi. He narrates that this hadith from some of his companions. Does he tell us who they are? No. What is this hadith called in the science of hadith? It's called a mursal hadith. What's a mursal hadith? It has a break in the chain, meaning we don't know who narrated this. Now why would a companion like Yunus ibn Abdul Rahman not tell us who he is? Two common reasons. One is taqiyya purposes. Remember, sometimes the companions of the Imam did not want to reveal their sources of knowledge because the authorities would go after them. They had to protect their identity. There were very difficult times at the times of the Imam. If the authorities realize you're narrating a hadith from someone who narrated it from the Imam, they'll go after him. That's one common reason. A second reason, sometimes they would forget. Because they narrate hadiths from so many narrators, they narrate from reliable sources, but they just forgot this particular hadith, who was it from? We don't know. He might have forgotten. So these are two possibilities. Or sometimes it could be later scribes who wrote the hadith, for whatever reason they omitted the, the chain. So he narrates this hadith, Su'ila Abu'l-Hasan alayhi salam. Abu'l-Hasan 
is the title of several of Imams of Ahlul Bayt. One of them is Al Imam Al Kadhim alayhi salam. One of them is Al Imam Al Rida alayhi salam. They are in, they are given the title Abu Al Hasan. In this particular hadith, it is Al Imam Al Kadhim alayhi salam whom he's narrating from. هل يسع الناس ترك المسألة عما يحتاجون إليه؟ Beautiful question. The Imam, the, the narrator, whoever that narrator is, the, it's an anonymous narrator. He asked the Imam, "Are people excused for not asking, for not knowing? Because most people don't know a lot about about faith, about the Quran." about the details of the religious sciences. Most people are ignorant of these. He's asking the Imam, are they excused in their ignorance or no? The Imam السلام, replies with one sentence, one word. He says, no, they're not excused. Their ignorance is not excused. Now there are a number of points to consider over here. Some people might say this is not fair. At the end, they did not know. Why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment hold them accountable for things they were not aware of? Is that fair or is that not fair? Let's give the example of civil laws. In our society, we have civil laws. Traffic laws, criminal laws, tax laws, all types of laws. If, in, if a citizen of a country violates that law, and they were not aware of the law. Are they excused? If you pass a red light, and you're being really honest, you really did not know. Let's just say you didn't know. You came from a country in which red means go. Right? It's, it could happen, let's say. <laughs> and that's you were under the impression that you could go. Can the police, does the police have the right to ticket you? Yes. To fine you? Of course. See, ignorance in our civil laws are not excused. Why do we expect God's laws, which are far more important, to be, you know, and for our ignorance to be excused? That's unfair. We know in our society, man-made laws, laws that were developed by humans, fallible humans, people who make mistakes. We have so much respect for our man-made laws such that we don't consider ignorance an excuse. Now, when it comes to the laws of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we expect, you know, our ignorance to be an excuse. That's unacceptable. The laws of God are more important than any laws you have in society. And when a law is very important, ignorance should never be an excuse. So that's one example that we can cite to justify why ignorance is not excused. Yes? So with the phrasing of the question, do they mean like deliberate ignorance? Like someone is like, okay, I don't want to ask because I don't want to be held accountable? We'll, we'll talk about that. What type of you know, ignorance is the companion referring to? The hadith seems general. It's not specific as to what type of ignorance. But there are some clues as to what type of ignorance. We'll get to that in a, in a few minutes. So that's the first point. The second point is the primary reason why people are ignorant of religious knowledge is not lack of access. It's negligence. People, when it comes to their worldly affairs, you see them paying so much attention. Even things like a vacation. Have you seen people going for a vacation these days? Do you know how many hours they put to research that vacation? First of all, let's say if they want to decide where they need to go. They'll spend days or weeks trying to figure out where is a top popular destination these days. Next, they think about how to buy the tickets. They go visit several travel agencies, try to shop around for the lowest fare, best flights. I know people sometimes they take weeks just doing that. After that, you want your accommodations, right? Your hotel. People will go on TripAdvisor, they'll read thousands of reviews for this hotel, that hotel, the location, the services, what type of rating, what type of stars, and then the restaurants, and then the activities. People spend sometimes, I'm not exaggerating, tens and tens and tens of hours on a 10-day vacation. On a 10-day vacation, yes, you would be surprised. Just go on TripAdvisor, you'll see. 
one day just go, you know, just to see. See those, you know, the blogs that they have or the posts that they have. On details, very minute details, you see pages and pages of people commenting and experience and research. Oh yes. Or sometimes if people want to buy a car. I know some people, they'll go into 20 dealerships and test drive 50 cars and do so much research for a piece, for a car that's going to get you from point A to point B. And so on and so forth. People these days sometimes will spend hours and hours on Amazon looking for an iPhone case, for God's sake. For an iPhone case. Read different reviews and then the screen protector and then the ch wireless charger and every, every day something's coming up, right? See, people do spend time when they want something. But when it comes to religion, they don't spend 1% of that time. They can, they have access. Allah has given them the means and the tools. They're negligent, they're careless. So that's one reason why the Imam السلام, says they're not excused. Because Allah gave them intellect for a small thing that lasts five days, they're willing to spend hours and hours. But for their akhirah, for their final destination, they're not willing. That's negligence. How else do you explain that other than negligence? Carelessness. And that's very problematic. Many, many people, after decades they realize, you know, their wudu was a mistake, their salah was a mistake. And honestly, I, I myself have made an assessment. For you to worship God properly at the bare minimum, you know, we don't need to delve into the mustahabbat of the salah and the fasting, you know, that, 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 that's kind of, uh, that requires a lot of effort. But for you to offer a salah at the bare minimum, Wudu at the bare minimum, ghusl at the bare minimum, just the bare minimum wajibat. To learn what invalidates your fasting at the bare minimum. My understanding, based on my assessment for the average person, some people might learn this very quickly, some people it might take a while. My assessment is to learn the bare minimum for your religion, what's halal, what's haram, 30 to 50 hours. 30 to 50 hours, you learn how to pray. What are the rules of fasting? What's halal, what's haram? I mean, how many harams do we have? Really, when you put the list of haram, what, 20, 30? Alcohol is haram, um, types of music is haram, pork is haram, for example, when it comes to the dietary requ requirements, backbiting, accusing people, that's haram. It's, they're limited. If I were to ask you right now to compose a list of what's haram, even for those who are well versed in the religious sciences, I doubt it you can give me more than 30 things on that list. I highly doubt it because there isn't that many on that list. For us to worship God at the bare minimum, we need 30 hours, let's say 50 hours. That's the time that some people will spend on one vacation, just researching. It. It's not, see it's not that demanding, we think it's demanding, it's not that demanding really. So if someone after 40 years, after 30 years of their lives, they have not dedicated 30 to 50 hours. Is that Allah's fault? The Imam's fault? Whose fault is that? Their fault. That's negligence. That's carelessness. What is 30 hours? What is 50 hours? We spend hours and hours, we, uh, you know, weeks and months watching TV. Now 30 hours, 50 hours just to save our religion is not much. This is the bare minimum, really, the bare minimum for you to fulfill your obligations. So the Imam Ali Salam in this hadith, he says, no, they are not excused. Now does that mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if someone was ignorant, will punish them? I know people born into families in which those families were completely secular. There was absolutely no role in religion. Some of them grow up and they really were not aware that they had to fast, they had to pray. What happens with these people? There are two points here. One is God forgiving or not forgiving. One is them being liable for that action. As for the first point, Allah is merciful. If someone really grew up in a family and due to their circumstances, they were just completely unaware that they had to investigate, there was fasting, there was prayer, just a secular family. If these people, when they grow up and realize and become aware and repent, Allah accepts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not punish them. However, that, does that mean they're off the hook? 
all those years they don't have to fast, all those years that they miss praying they don't have to make the qada, no. Allah forgives but Allah says now bring it, now that you're aware you have to compensate for all those years. Some people see this as a burden, it's not a burden, it's an opportunity. Because every salah that this person missed, they missed out on something very big. Allah's rahma is that He's giving us another chance. Allah says, okay for 10 years you missed out, I'm giving you another opportunity, I'm giving you another chance. So the one who has many years of qada should not see that as a burden, that's an opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving you, be thankful to Him. Because every missed salah, that loss is greater than losing the entire world. Absolutely, believe in that, we have a hadith about that. That's the value of one prayer in the eyes of God. So that's an opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us. So when it comes to the qada, we are obligated. What about the kafara? Let's say for someone who did not fast. I know a lot of sisters, you know, will come and say, say it, you know, I was nine, nobody explained to me fasting, I, I honestly was not aware. Many, many years later I realized that I had to fast, since I became religiously mature, and now you're telling me every day that I broke my fast, I have to pay a kafara, and the kafara is pretty heavy. Either you feed 60 people, which is about $120 if you want to, you know, give the monetary amount, or you fast two months for every day, <laughs> no one's gonna do that, right? People are barely fasting the wajib month of Ramadan. Now for every day two months, no one really does that. Now scholars have mentioned that if someone was completely unaware that they had to fast, they were not even aware that fasting is an obligation, I know people who come from such families, Muslim families, but they're so secular, no one even makes a mention of Ramadan, of fasting, they really did not know. These people are not considered deliberately breaking their fast, so they just do the qada without having to pay for the kafara. But if someone knew that this is the month of Ramadan, fasting is wajib, Allah who created you made this wajib on you, if they understand this much, then yes, they would have to pay the kafara. So it really depends on the person's uh, circumstances as well, when it comes to trying to figure out if a person is excused or not. Now the hadith says, are people excused to leave off asking, not to ask? Now does that mean that the only way to seek knowledge is to ask? When the companion asked the Imam السلام, are we excused for not asking? Asking is just one way to learn knowledge, it doesn't mean that you literally have to go and ask, because in back then with their limited resources really the only way for you to seek knowledge is to go ask a scholar. But these days you can go online, you could read books, and a lot of knowledge will be delivered to you. So whenever we have these words like ask those who know, it doesn't necessarily mean literally go ask a question, it just means seek knowledge. But because back then the most common form of, of seeking knowledge was asking a question, we have that in the Quran and we have that in the Ahadith. Any questions on this Hadith? It's, it's really important you know to consider who's excused or not. I know many people will try to come up with excuses and you know they'll say why make this too difficult on us, but if, if you just examine our lives we really see there is a lot of negligence, especially in our time and age, especially these days when everything is accessible, really no one's excused for not knowing. Everything is out there, everything is out there. I know just a few days ago I was at a gathering and one of the youth uh, made an interesting statement, we were talking about a certain topic and then he said never in my life here and he's like I've attended nearly all speeches and lectures, I've never heard a scholar talk about this topic, he made that statement. 
So I told him, you know, fair enough, you know, that's fine, this might indicate that scholars need to do more to address this topic. But just here in this community, in the last year, I can pinpoint you to that program and this program and this program in which this particular topic was addressed. And, and he was shocked. And he was a person who is not negligent, right? He is on top of things when it comes to these programs. It's out there. Everything is out there. And if we want to find it, sometimes you just, within one, you know, touch of a button, you can find everything that you're looking for. So it's very important for us to know. Now, one thing I recommend for people, especially people who are not well versed in, in, in Islamic laws, whenever you're trying to find out what you need to know, you can go online and try to do your research. It could take a while. My recommendation is ask a scholar or someone who knows. Go to a scholar, tell him, look, what do I need to know for my bare minimum faith? Tell me. When it comes to my daily life, my business, my salah, my fasting, tell me what is the bare minimum that I need to know. Because sometimes you may not be aware of certain things because you're so busy in your career with your life, you don't really have time to figure out what you need to know. So go and ask. Simply ask and in one session a scholar can give you the general points that you need to know. It's not really that much. Yes, brother. I want to make a comment in regards to that. Uh, even when they're researching, if the person is really not educated, he doesn't know if the resources or whatever he is reading is reliable or not. Yes, that's a very important point. Today, everything's on the internet. And you need to make sure that the sources you're consulting are trusted sources. So also ask a scholar or an expert. Tell them, you know, I am interested in examining these sources. Are these reliable sources or not? Because some sources are not reliable. Not everything on the internet is trustworthy. That's a very important point. Yes, brother. Um, so along those lines, but maybe it would be a different topic, so please let me know if it is a different topic or not. So right now for the past 10 minutes, you just gave a flavor of how much negligence there is out there. So when you start thinking about that in terms of during the course of 24 hours, how much you have neglected, things can add up very quickly and easily. It's, a, it's daily negligence, absolutely. Daily negligence. So now, let's say an individual, 30 years of their lives, they have been negligent, knowingly, to a certain degree, knowingly. After 30 years of their life, they suddenly get, you know, they become aware that, okay, maybe I ne neglected enough. I'm going to go now and be more, I would say, religious along those lines and follow the rules. The next day, something happens that they become they, a shaheed. They pass yeah. away. Well, they become a shaheed now. Shaheed, okay. They That's the highest shaheed. form. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> they become a shaheed. So, all those years of negligence, would that be forgiven for a shaheed? That's a very good question. If someone spent 30, 40 years of their lives neglecting these religious obligations and all this knowledge, and then one day it hits them hard. That, what am I doing? I'm getting older and older and I'm not prepared. I'm not aware of the necessary knowledge that I need to know. So they have that internal change. They make the sincere intention to start over and not to be negligent. And they make a program for themselves. Starting from tomorrow, I'm putting two hours a day to compensate. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had other plans for them. The next day, either they pass away or they become a shaheed. There's, you know, something happens and they're defending their land, their faith, their imam, they become a shaheed. What happens to the fate of such a person? That's a very good question. I think in order to address a scenario like that, we can always look at earlier precedents in the religion of Islam, especially with the companions of the Prophet and the companions of the imams of Ahlul Bayt, who repented last minute. Many of the people who died as shuhada in the Prophet's life in those battles, many of them were last minute people, people who joined Islam last minute, spent an entire lifetime in sin, repented last minute, became a shaheed. Or when it comes to Al-Hur like you mentioned, the companion of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. All his life he was not in the path of Ahlul Bayt. He was an honorable man, a man of courage, a man of nobility, a man of valor, but he was not in the path of Ahlul Bayt. And in fact, he was instrumental in stopping Imam Hussein from going to Kufa. 
he came with 4,000 soldiers and they blocked the Imam Ali Salam from going. That's before Amr ibn Sa'ad would arrive with other soldiers. But on the day of Ashura, when he realized that Umar ibn Sa'ad wants to kill the Imam Ali Salam, he stopped for a moment. He had his repentant repentance moment. He saw himself between heaven and hell. It was a very tough decision to make, extremely tough. 99% of warriors cannot make that decision. Why? Because your reputation is at stake. He was known, his companion tells him when he sees him shaking, he tells him, Hur, why do you shake? If I were to be asked who is the most courageous warrior in Kufa, I would say you. Now when you're a warrior, you don't suddenly switch sides in the battlefield. Imagine what people will say. You have a lifetime of reputation that you've built. Now you're shaking? It's, it's very difficult. No one's willing to do that. But he did. He's like, you know what? I'm not going to choose anything over paradise. So he goes to the Imam Ali Salam and he repents. And he becomes a shaheed minutes later. And eternally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses him and he becomes one of the 72 martyrs. That in itself reveals that once the genuine niyyah comes and you act upon it. Because see, it's not like he said, you know what, this is wrong, let me walk away from the battlefield. Allah would not have accepted his tawbah. That's not how you compensate. You have to show genuine action. So he came and he said, allow me be, to be the first to die. That's tough too. The first one going out on the battlefield requires a lot of courage. So we see that because of that solid intention, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compensated for all those years of being misguided and for stopping Imam Hussein alayhi salam from going to Kufa. That one act is very valuable in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if someone after years and years of negligence truly repents, has a concrete plan to now compensate, they die. Let's not say they become a shaheed because the shaheed has a very high status. Let's say they just pass away. Allah will forgive them. Allah will forgive because Allah was, in the end this person died with the right intention. That's what's important. Your intention at the moment of death is extremely important. But to continue that, there's also the narrations and saying that Allah may forgive you of everything. But there could be two things that he may not, or uh, two things that the Imams may not give shafaha on your behalf, which would be one would be perhaps uh, confiscating somebody else's haq, whatever that may be, mm -hmm. right? Whether you hit somebody by mistake, or you stole something, or you did whatever that would qualify within the category of haq, Allah would not just easily surpass over that. Or perhaps in the area of prayers too, if I'm not mistaken. To these two yes. things that you cannot overlook that. So how would you d define that, uh, how would you say that would be for the individual who either becomes shaheed or a true person who just made So let's say someone does become shaheed or they truly repent and die on, on that correct niyyah and they have violated the rights of others or they were negligent with their salah because the hadith says لا تنالوا شفاعتنا لا تنالوا شفاعتنا مستخفا بصلاته The one who's negligent with his prayers, our shafa'ah shall not include him. Now, how do, how do we address people like that? Let's say a person died as a shaheed, but they have violated people's rights. If this person really died on that correct niyyah, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do briefly on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will summon the person whom he violated, the oppressed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will tell the oppressed, don't you ex expect me to forgive you? You also have sins and you violated others. Do you expect me to forgive you? Forgive him and I'll forgive you. That in itself encourages them to forgive the shaheed or the person who violated them and who died on the right path. If they still insist, they're like, you know what, I've seen people like that. Some people say there's nothing in the world, salamu alaikum, that will make me forgive that person. I don't care, even if I go to hell, I'm not forgiving that person. On the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show you your status in paradise, let's say. You're at level 100 and you see it in front of you. Allah says, I've prepared this for you. But if you forgive so-and-so person, I'll make it 200. And Allah will show you 200. When you compare between the two, 
it's a no-brainer. You're going to forgive. What do you have to lose? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if, if you still want to bargain with Allah, Allah is generous. You'll still say, no, I'm not going to forgive him. Allah will show you level 400, and then 600, and then 800, until the hadith says Allah will make you satisfied. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have that person forgive them. Then once they're forgiven, the shafa'ah will include them. So that's briefly how we would address that. I mean, that gets more complex from <laughs> <laughs> but uh, please let me know we can discuss this later. We, we can continue the discussion inshallah, no problem. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin. Allahumma salli ala muhammadin wa alihi al-tahirin.